A little over a year ago, one of my friends, Brent, had come to me about building him his first pro rig. And like a lot of us, when we get our first rig put together, or maybe even our second, third, or fourth rig put together, as guitar players, our eyes are always bigger than our stomachs. And Brent built this beautiful board with me that used a PVC 10, had every possible conceivable pedal that you'd ever want on there, and it wasn't practical. Once he got this thing out, was doing gigs, was doing rehearsals, he just found that even though it had everything he wanted, it was more than he wanted. It was almost like he overdid it at the buffet. And this isn't a problem that's unique to Brent. This is something that I've seen happen with countless guitar players that I've worked with over the years, where they want every possible option on the table. But then when they get it into a real life gigging situation, they realize it is totally impractical to have a pedal board this big. And so invariably they end up spending a lot of money to basically build their pedal board twice. They built it big, they realized it was too big, and then they had to build it again in a smaller fashion. So today we're gonna learn from Brent as our example and countless other guitar players that have fallen into the same trap. And I'm gonna show you some tips and some tricks to be a great editor of your pedal board how to make the most out of the space that you have available, and how to have a framework for your decision making for your pedals to determine whether they're gonna be on the board or if this is gonna need to be something that you use in an audition loop or something that's just off of the pedal board that maybe is just used on occasion. This framework is gonna help you make sure that not only are you consolidating your pedal board, but also how to make the most space out of the pedal board that you have, how to make accommodations for changes on the pedal board to make it a little bit more modular without having to change the structure or the wiring of the pedal board. These tips are gonna help you save time, save money, and save space on your pedal board. So let's get into it on how to become a better editor of your pedal board. The first thing to consider when you're planning your rig in terms of being a good editor is consider your context. Are you a pro? Are you an amateur? Are you gonna be flying or traveling with this board? Or is this something that you're just gonna be moving yourself? Do you have somebody to help you with this? Do you have a roadie? Or are you gonna be your own roadie when you have set up for every single gig? These are all critically important things to consider. If you're doing all of your own kind of roadie work and you're setting up your own pedal board, building your own pedal board, doing your own technician work, then maybe you can get away with a little larger board since you're gonna be the one responsible for it at the end of the day. But even so, some people just want an easy to move, easy to travel with board, even if it's just to local gigs. If you're somebody who's flying a lot, then weight becomes a critically important factor. You got 50 pounds to deal with in terms of the pedal board in the case. If you go beyond that, most airlines will charge you at least a $75 overweight baggage fee. So that's something you want to avoid as well, just something to keep in mind as you're planning the pedal board. And another thing to consider as well, whether you're a pro or an amateur, is, is just the, the time that it takes to move a heavy case all over the place, whether that's upstairs, whether that's downstairs, depending on whether you got an attic gig or you got a basement gig, or you just have to move it out of your car, that can also become really tiresome. And even players like Brent, who is just a hobbyist, still had those exact same problems, even though he was in charge of his own gear, hauling his own pedal board, setting it up and breaking it down every night. So this brings me to my second consideration and, and really more advice is what I call the 90-10 rule. In terms of when you design your pedal board, I really recommend that people design it around the idea of the 90% of the time pedals that you're gonna use on every single gig. So you don't wanna occupy space on your pedal board with stuff that's really not part of your core sound or the core song elements that are gonna be part of the gig that you're playing. That could be cover bands, that could be original music, whatever it is. The 90-10 rule has never steered me wrong. I look at the pedals that I have, I look at the songs I need to perform, and I'm looking to see which ones are used on 90% of the songs, and I build that as the core part of my pedal board. Now that last 10 are things that maybe are used in fringe examples. Maybe they're used on a passage of one song. Maybe they're just used on a chorus of one song. Or maybe it's just a single foot switch that you step on for a single bar or measure of a song. Those are not things that generally I wanna take up space with my pedal board. And if I do need to absolutely have those effects, then there's considerations for things like multi-effects. So a single stomp box pedal that may perform multiple functions that can take care of some of those fringe things like an HX stomp, or I know a lot of guys in Nashville like using the M5s for that particular reason. Or getting something that's maybe an all-inclusive of a specific type of effect. So a modulation unit like let's say the Strymon Mobius or the Boss MD500. Those sorts of devices incorporate all your modulation effects in one, or if it's a delay effect, incorporates all those into one 
or your pitch effects. If you've got something like a pitch factor from Eventide or an H9, that could incorporate all of your pitch effects in one. Those are sort of things that you might need to double up on depending on what your tolerance is for not only the fidelity of the sound that you're going for to maybe what a standalone unit might provide and also space. Are you willing to give up a few pedals to consolidate into one that maybe doesn't sound quite as good but covers a lot more ground? This is what I call, again, the 90-10 rule. You really want to make your choices of the pedals that are on the board based on it being 90% of the stuff that you use across the entire set list. Those are the things that need to be on there. The other things either need to be absorbed into multi-effects or those could even be things that live in audition loops or live loose off the board. The third thing that I recommend to people who want to be great editors of their board is really consider the future. Make sure that your boards are malleable, that they can be adapted to some degree. I know that a lot of us think that this is going to be the last pedal board that we ever make and that we're really set on whatever we have, but the truth is, is that as guitar players, we're always changing out our gear. We always want to try out the latest, greatest thing. And I think that's important to consider when you're building your rig. What I like to do, especially when I'm doing switcher type rigs like I have here for Brent, is I like to loop the cables back onto themselves. So then that way I could always accommodate a top mounted jack or a side mounted jack, no matter what pedal went into that place. So presuming that the pedal is roughly equal in size, I can accommodate any position of a DC power jack or I could accommodate any position of the input and output cables that are carrying the audio signal. So you can see here on this rig that I did that so that I'm able to really go in any direction that I want. If I get tired of a pedal and want to swap out that pedal, it's always a good idea to do that with your DC and your audio. I have several videos showing how to achieve a nice neat look like we have here for Brent that you can check out above. This will just help you make sure that you keep everything clean. Looping it back is not going to be a big consequence in terms of the, the look or aesthetic of the pedal board. It keeps it clean still, but gives you that option to be modular in the future. And I think that that's something that we always need to consider as guitar players and not necessarily have to get bigger. A last consideration in terms of these pedal boards and, and really being a good editor, I think can also come down to material choice. I think especially for switcher rigs, like what Brent has in consolidating those and still maintaining a switcher on the board, Definitely using something that is a tiered system like the Vertex pedal boards that we used for Brent's case. We went from 29 by 16 on his original board, consolidated that down to 17 by 10 on this board, still kept a lot of the same functionality, lost a few pedals, but really made it so it had all the needs met, but also was able to be programmable, still had a programmable delay and reverb, a great all-in-one with the collider being the delay and reverb working in parallel, so this thing can still do a wet dry if you wanted to, or it can be all run in series just as a standard pedal board or it can actually go for cable method. So it has a lot of different options there in terms of the routing that still maintains the same exact options of the original, just with a couple fewer pedals. But overall using this sort of system where you have a tiered pedal board, it made it so that we could consolidate, we could bury pedals that are controlled by the switcher that don't need immediate access. We still have the MIDI programmability so that we're able to bring in pedals and groups as we want. We have a MIDI control delay and reverb so that we're able to recall any preset through MIDI but not have to have that delay or reverb wired into the actual loops of the actual switcher. So it exists independently of that, and we're just doing all the on-off control, all the program changes, all via MIDI. So it makes it really, really easy to be able to actually have an additional pedal that doesn't have to meet the same number of loops that are in the actual switcher itself with the PVC 6X having six regular loops, one insert loop, and then we have the collider controlled through MIDI. So in essence, we're controlling everything as though we're in the switcher, but having one pedal out of the switcher using that tiered pedal board system allows us to duplicate that surface area above and below the tier itself. So we get that double surface area, makes it really easy to open it up with that hinge, have access to all the cables, the plugs, the knobs, whenever we need them, and then close it back up, lock it down with the thumb screw, and you're all good to go. So I hope you dug this video about how to become a better editor of your pedal board. Again, it's really just a few easy steps to consider. Firstly, really know your context. Make sure you know what your limitations are gonna be for traveling, for bringing this thing on an airline, whether overweight is gonna be an issue for you, whether you're just a local guy that's gonna be hauling your own gear, setting it up, tearing it down, are you willing to invest that extra time? Are you willing to lug a heavy pedal board? These are all decisions that are up to you to make. And if you want to consolidate, then you have some great tips. The 90-10 rule, making sure that you're basing your pedal board around what you're using 90% of the time throughout and across all the music that you're going to be performing. And then using some of those more fringe things either off the board or incorporating those into multi-effect sort of devices like Bren is doing for his Collider 
combining reverb and delay into one multi-effect unit. Also, making sure that you're leaving room for changes. You never want to be too locked into your choices. As guitar players, we know we're changing our mind all the time. Looping back those cables, leaving a little extra slack, using my video to kind of show you how to do this appropriately so that you can still keep a really nice, neat look and still have that ability to be able to change for similar sized pedals. And if you got a great switcher like this RGM, you can even change the order. So there almost is zero consequence to making changes when you're using a great switcher like this. And lastly, choosing materials that are gonna allow you to maximize your surface area. Tiered pedal boards like our Vertex pedal boards, other great ones would be like the Friedman pedal boards or the Schmidt Array, also have a similar tiered system where you're able to duplicate surface area below the tier and above the tier, stash things away that's controlled by the switcher, makes it a really great way to save space on your rig. If you like what you saw today, I highly recommend you like, you subscribe, leave us a comment on one of the big takeaways that you had from this video, if you had any, or other tips that might help other viewers figure out how to consolidate and be better editors of their rig. If you want to support what we're doing here, I also recommend you check out therigdr.com. We sell our pedal boards there, all the patch cables, zip ties, Velcro, tie down mounts, all the materials that we use for the pedal boards. Also head over to vertexeffects.com. You can buy a lot of the pedals that you found on this pedal board and you can get free DIY materials like how to build your own interface buffer, all those types of things, just the same as we did here on Brent's rig. Lastly, you can check out the Rig Doctor podcast over on all the popular podcatchers, iTunes, Spotify, etc. And go and listen to some of our longer form versions of some of our conversations on gear and tone and pedal boards. I think you're going to dig it. Until next time, I'm Mason Marangella from Vertex Effects, aka The Rig Doctor. See you later.